Hello, and welcome to tonight's stream. Uh, this is the Rollwise podcast, and this is our Monday actual play slash stream. And what we're hoping to do tonight is uh, we're going to be doing a little bit of an examination of Daggerheart character creation. Uh, with the recent open beta of Daggerheart, um, it has been quite the talk of the town based on what I've read. So I thought we would take a little bit of a stab of it, at it. Now, the one thing, disclaimer, uh, that seems to be mighty prevalent through all this stuff is that uh, everything is un in playtest mode. So, I mean, we may be looking at rules that may not exist in a year. So, By the way, we're good. You're good? Yep. So, okay. And our sound engineer, Brent, is telling me that I'm good. Jeff, are you good? I'm good. Yeah. Seems good. All right. You, you just got a promotion. <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've created a new job and you've been promoted to sound engineer. Um, not to diminish what other sound engineers do, but Brent does try his best. Um, so, uh, I'm a sound checker. I think sound engineer is more you. <laughs> Well, I've got a, I got a story to tell you. Um, <laughs> my my computer isn't powerful enough for me to do sound engineering uh, while we're streaming. So, sorry. Uh, but yeah, so the uh, so tonight we wanted to kind of get in get into the weeds a little bit, talk uh, a little bit about the character creation process and everything like that, in anticipation of hopefully next week, uh, starting the initial play test. Uh, there is a, a playtest adventure that they included with all the materials and everything like that. So we're going to give that a go of it. Um, the playtest adventure does include pre-generated characters as well as kind of a narrative explanation uh, of the game, which I thought was kind of neat. I, I know you guys haven't experienced it yet, uh, but next week we'll go through it. I thought what they did is they actually populated narrative text for you to read to your players to repair them for the game which is very different than what I've experienced, whereas they just kind of give you a wall of text, ask you to read it, say, good luck. This one kind of forces you to tell the story as you go. So kind of thought that was neat. So uh, first things first, um, this is by no means intended to be a uh, an advertisement for Demiplane, but um, we did, there were two things that you is that if you really wanted to get into Daggerheart, you can do everything on the pen and paper. Uh, and I think that's what they kind of want you to do because I feel like they really want you to have the tactile sensation behind the game. Um, you know, this game is really encouraging you to use, um, you know, tokens, tokens and, and standees stuff like and cards. Tokens, yep. standees, cards, pencils, papers, um, everything that you can kind of imagine at your gaming table. And I, I hadn't really thought about it, but using tokens while you roll, would that be satisfying to add that weight, that heft to it? You guys, you guys feel like that's your that's your jam? Because I mean, I've done so many virtual games that I haven't really needed to touch a physical pair of dice. Yeah, I haven't chucked dice in a while. I mean, yeah, me neither. Um, I like I like rolling physical dice, but I actually don't mind rolling virtual dice either. Like yeah. I said, I'm pretty easy when it comes to gaming, so. I am too. I think, it's just, just I think tokens are kind of nice just because like I said you can you can I think you can immerse the players a little bit better if you have things like tokens or or things mm -hmm. of that nature. Yeah. Props are always good. Any sort of prop I think is good if you're in a in-person game. Yeah. So um so let's start with just kind of the the what they shared with us on the uh on the actual playtest material. And I thought I would grab one of the class packages as kind of like an example as what people have seen. Um, and so these are the steps that they've outlined to kind of give you an idea as to how to create your first level character. Um, so, you know, you have your choose your class, you know, and, it, and what's interesting is your class is probably your most important choice for a lot of the, the benefits that you derive on your character sheets. Um, and so, like, for example, your class tells you what your evasion is, your hit points, your thresholds. Like, there's a lot that is determined by what your class is. Um, and really, that there's a lot of classes to choose from. So it's kind of a kind of an odd start. Now, I do know that some games are kind of moving. There, there have been some proposed classless versions of these games for, like, D&D &D and stuff like that. But I don't know. You guys, uh, you guys excited to choose your class before you choose everything else? Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, then you'll choose a subclass, you know, that's basically, uh, it kind of defines your focus. 
you'll then have a heritage, which is basically what they decided is their ancestry and community. Ancestry being kind of like your, I mean, I don't really know how to, I think I'd be pre-programmed this way, but I'm not really sure how to like avoid saying race in the game. So it's basically your genetic lineage that what you can yeah. go with your ancestry is your ancestry whether or not you're an elf or a human or except or a frog exactly um that's or what it's know. going to be um whereas your community tells you what type of community you hail from kind of like a noble type an underbelly of the city type and they have they have uh distinct cards or, or groupings for each of those um now setting your traits and everything like that uh, as well as your evasion. Now, this game doesn't really have you roll any dice. Um, this is Brent's favorite style of game. Um, uh -oh. oh, you mean for character creation? Yes, for yeah, character creation. Yeah, it doesn't roll, but yeah. Oh, look at this. Uh, we have a comment from Matthew. Uh, said the D&D combat is a terrible drag for me, and I've joined the combat in this system. Hmm. Well, we oh, thank you. Forward to it. Well, thank you for sharing, and we appreciate uh, the comment because we have we haven't done yeah. combat in the system, so it'll be interesting to see how it flows. Because based on what I've read from the critical role people and everything like that, it has a very different flow because of the the actions. Uh, it, yeah, and the no initiative is is a little bit. It's another one of those games that uh, it's like no initiative at all. Mm -hmm. so. No initiative. I have to use like there's tokens that I use to have my minions go and all that stuff. There's a lot of there's a, it's going to be a very different feel from D and D in that regard. Yeah, thank you for the uh, comment. Yeah. It definitely doesn't take two or three hours of combat, which I like. I <laughs> like that too. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I, I personally find that combat, if like used judiciously, is very enticing to the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of narrative games that we've been playing lately where combat has been over very quickly. Um, Jeff, I believe, in your Alien game, you know, you ran into a xenomorph, and and you basically were like, "I fire a bullet. Oh, it bounced off its skin. I I'm leaving. Out of here." <laughs> well, I did. I, I I was going to attack again, and then the my, the other person I was in the room with, their arm started getting ripped off. Mm -hmm. So I took that as a chance to to exit. This is a good reason to leave. And yeah, yeah. shorter <laughs> combat. I think shorter combats are always better. Um, as we saw in the fourth edition game, like. Combats that go on for too long just become, yeah. Well, it, it stops feeling like you're doing something and feels like you're struggling through something, which I, I'm not saying that you have to win all the time, but a quicker resolution mm -hmm. is genuinely, generally better, or feeling like you're getting closer to the resolution is better, I think. But, well, and I, it's, and it's I, encouraging to hear about the combat in Daggerheart. Yeah. And to answer your question, no, you can't um, necessarily combat a xenomorph. You either food or you trap it, I suspect. <laughs> well, I mean, one of us, we'll talk about this later, but one of us killed one. I mean, a baby one, but still. <laughs> a little tiny one. Um, okay. So setting your thresholds and hope, um, you know, damage thresholds and everything like that. This is where, based on my read of it, it got a little bit wonky because there was a, a lot of abstraction happening between when you take damage and when you take hit points and everything like that. So, I mean, that's that'll be the part that I, I really will be curious to see what happens in combat if that really translates. Like, I because I think it's one of those things that in the beginning you're probably going to be like, oh, I have to, where do I land on this chart? Do I use an armor? All that kind of stuff. Um, but then, of course, you start the game with two hope. Now, hope it just on my initial impression it seems like the mechanic that will be very liquid now in in fallout we played with the like i was a little bit confused at that meta currency because i it was just coming and going so quickly but i have a feeling that hope is going to be at that level or or higher <laughs> you think that much mm -hmm. yeah because okay. because you earn action points in the fallout game at a much lower rate because you have to succeed more than your target number right right, right. Succeed. and so Whereas this one is it if you just roll with hope, <laughs> you, you know, you, and I can't say that the the percentage of dice to get hope because statistically I don't think it's a 50 50. I think it's close though. But if you roll with hope, um, you get hope. And so you get to spend this currency and all that kind of stuff. So I think you'll be getting it and spending it a lot in the game, which I don't know if that does good on paper sheets, honestly. 
be true. Uh, again, that would be good for to- it would be That's one of those token things. I think a good mm-hmm. reason to have tokens at your table. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I think tokens or chips or something would work good because, as as anybody who's watched, I'm not a huge fan of erasing stuff on a paper sheet <laughs> more than you know once or twice because the sheet just dies eventually. Okay. And, yeah, you know, poker, poker chips are fun to fiddle with at the table. So. <laughs> Well, and I think that's that's the part that I was literally thinking about is that like you know you basically you know, erasing marking and erasing marking you you'd destroy your paper in like a single session kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, choose your starting weapons. Uh, decide what kind of weapons you want. Choose your starting armor. Take your starting inventory. So you know get your adventurers pack and all that kind of stuff. Uh, choose your description. You know so kind of like monster of the week. You'll choose some like things that kind of describe your overall nature, and you get to flesh that out. Uh, take your domain cards, um, and I think that's that's going to be something that's interesting. Is when they talk about the domains in the character creation process, is that you know it seems like they've got domains set up so that each character, you know, each class has its two domains, but it doesn't seem like that would be too far of a stretch to start being able to mix and match your domains and create new character classes. That you know, because it's like the the thief is like midnight and bone, I think. Oh, we'll find out. No, um, I, think the, I think the warrior is like bone and blade. Yeah, well, some there there are classes that is there are, overlap. Yeah, there is overlap. Not er, like I don't think there's overlap for every one of them, but I think that that you know they're definitely the the um, the things that you'll see on each of them, unless I'm misremembering which donate domains are. Um, answering your background questions, generating experience, and I like the I like the experience that you generate with this because it reminds me a lot of like the I want to say fade aspects. Is that you know you basically have like just a utility saying oh I was a bartender so I have a you know I get to roll with my experience whenever I get into a drinking contest because obviously it's harder to drink me under the table kind of thing. Um, record your name and pronouns and then create cre- connections. So I think that when you start to look at like how the character sheet and everything like that goes into it, um, having just played fourth edition D and D. I think this is pretty simple looking. Do you guys agree, or where do you guys where do you guys? Uh, yeah, it definitely has more of a narrative bend, less than a um, like numbers bend, which is what you were looking at in fourth edition. Like you were really calculating a lot of numbers, mm-hmm. um, and depending on how like, and I think there's only when you're first starting a character, like there isn't a ton of cards. Like in fourth edition, there seemed like there was a ton of options, but there really. Mm-hmm. It really wasn't so you had to keep like looking back and forth to see what your options were yeah jeff what about you i know that the fourth edition character sheet gave you a little bit of a twitch after we had kind well, of uh, this it. hopefully this looks like it's laid out a little bit better um you know it's it's essentially it's mm-hmm. essentially two columns except for the row at the top um hopefully you don't have to write any walls of text in there you know what I mean? Where yeah. they provide you like with four lines and one thing takes up three of those lines. And so everything else you're writing in, you're curving around the side and writing as small as you can. And then you can never read it again. Like, yeah, I, I mean, that's that's a problem with some character sheets because everybody's trying to go, well, I, I don't want this thing to be eight pages. Well, nobody does. But if that's the way you designed your game, then I guess that's how long the character sheet needs to be. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So and uh, and I think that you're probably right. Uh, there are there are probably some of the same options with different names. And I felt like because um, we had just used the the fourth edition character builder, and I think that was the secret to success in creating a character in 4e and not having it be a confusing experience. Especially since we were just kind of like refreshing ourselves on it. I have obviously played it a lot less than these guys have, just because for whatever reason I tried to get into it and it just never stuck with me. Um, so now that we're looking at a possibly fourth edition remaster, and it seems like both this and MCDM seem to drew inspiration from it, drew yeah. inspiration from fourth edition. It wouldn't surprise me to see some of that. Um, now here are some of the uh, the things that on the on the next page. Here are some of the things that I thought were neat is that they did give you a lot of suggestions as to how you could get quick started with a lot of this. Um, so you know suggested traits so where would where would we suggest you place your traits if you have no idea what you're doing what are your suggested weapons armors and inventory and all that kind of stuff 
Um, and then what I liked what they did is they just kind of gave you almost like a monster of the week approach to how you do, how you define your character. You know, they have clothes that are in, and what you would typically do if this is a paper sheet is you would just say like reinforced or I'd have a reinforced sparring clothes. You know, you just kind of circle the adjectives that best describe um, how you do this. And then, of course, you describe your character in greater detail when that's done. Oops. And then, of course, uh, background questions. I thought the background questions were interesting because they were based on your your character class. Not They weren't just a set of uniform background questions. Mm -hmm. But who taught you to fight? And why did and why did they stay behind when you left home? Good question. Uh, and adds a little bit of depth to it. Now, I think it would be interesting to see if they ex continue to expand on the background questions or if like, if you play one warrior for a year, then you start a, another character do you, and you wanted to play a warrior again for some reason because you're absolutely in love with the class. Would you stick with the similar background questions or would you define your own? Mm -hmm. And then of course, uh, connections. You know, how did we, you know, this is how we connect with the other people in the party. And I do appreciate games that take a moment to like actually define connections between party members, because it always it always over it, it always overcomes that you know rather than you're three people in a bar and you just are thrust together in this immediate certain circum uh, you know circumstance, like how do you build that the characters' relationships with each other and not have it seem just so forced? If that makes right. sense. Yeah. <laughs> Because I, I know there were less of your tavern meeting, uh, your happenstance tavern meeting, than uh, you mm -hmm. know. Well, and I think there's a lot of times where I, I don't know, and I'd, I'd be curious what other people's experience with this are, but I think a lot of people just hand wave their characters' connections with each other, and they just they're just a, an adventuring group together that is because they're together. <laughs> I think Brent, you said it best a long time ago, where it's just like, well, why are they go together? We don't know, but we're together. Right. Yeah, players are really good at that. Players are like, we're all together. Well, why Why are you all together? I don't know. And I guess one of the things that I've started to realize as I've gotten older is like, sometimes I don't understand. Like, you wind up in a friend group sometimes that's like that, where it's like, I don't know, why do we all hang out together? Well, we all like each other. Or we all work together. Oh, okay. But, but why in the beginning did we start hanging out? <laughs> and Brent, I couldn't tell you. I think you were just like, I'm going to go watch people punch people in the face. And I was like, oh, sure, I'll join you at a UFC fight. You know, I don't. I don't even know if oh, that yeah. was. Oh, yeah. I think we invited, I, I think uh, I invited you to the USC fights once. Uh, for That was the first thing, yeah. Yeah, you were like, hey, this guy might like watching people punch each other in the face. I'm going to buy a pay-per-view and we'll eat pizza. And I think so you, it was. You invited him once and he just kept showing up. Though. Yeah, and and see, and I feel like that's a that's a, that's a a perfectly valid origin story these days. <laughs> we, we talked to each other once and one of us never went away. That's. And the other person that didn't object. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the other person didn't make a big deal out of it. So we were good from that on. Yeah, yeah then so, you're invested in each other. So, like, you know, meet in a tavern. It sounds like a cliche, but really, like, how did you meet your friends? <laughs> yeah, those origin stories are a lot weirder than you think if you really went back to the beginning. Especially when you're all like, oh, hey, you seem kind of cool. We talk at meetings because, you know. I saw you were yeah the awkward the awkward guy I know at work uh, becomes my friend thing is is always an interesting start. You're a so, nerd. I'm a nerd too. But there's always that moment where it's like, are you really a nerd? Yeah, yeah. We have to, we have to uh, we have to fight for it. Um, so looking at the Daggerheart Nexus, I thought this was actually kind of a, an interesting you know thing because first of all, I had not use demi plan at all and it, it's just one of those things where i thought it had maybe a lot more paid content was maybe the reason why i never used it but uh it just really wasn't something i had um i had really dug into very deep and so this weekend i i kind of was like oh the dagger heart nexus has all this stuff loaded up into it so first of all you get a little bit of a nicer introduction to the actual game rules because you can see all the playtest materials I can't say for certain I understand how this is going to get update, uh, you know, like like how you would even know if this is updated because I didn't see anywhere that this that this was like version 1.2 or version 1.3 or something like that. Um, however, it does look as though you can, you know, view the source if you really want to get into it. Um, but yeah, so the first thing it was I thought was kind of neat was kind of getting into the player principles. 
Now, for the tone of a game, I personally find tone is like super important for what games I want to play. And I'm curious, like, you know, because what do you guys use when when you're attracted to a game? I mean, we're we're on a podcast, so we're basically on this like quest to play fun games and enjoy the hell out of them. But a typical person, like, what do you think a typical person looks at for a game? Or Matthew, if you want to say what what you're looking for in a game, like, why would you even look at the, picking up this game? I was going to say, I haven't been a typical person in a long time. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. Like, it's like I, I think one of the, what I would be looking for is something that is D&D adjacent. Like we've talked about before where like it's a high fantasy character driven game where I don't have to give a house for my money um, would be one of the one of the reasons that I would see, see people picking up this game. Yeah. What about you, Jeff? Where do you where do you fall on that spectrum of what would draw you to this game over over everything there, else on the shelf? There, there has to be something that hooks me. I, I, you know, there it has to be in a in a style of game that I want to play. Like usually, when you hear a synopsis of what the game is trying to accomplish, mm-hmm. you know, the 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 elevator pitch, if you will. Sure. Um, if if I'm intrigued then I'll give it a shot. If I'm not, then I'm probably not super interested unless somebody that I really trust says, this is really good. You mm-hmm. should give it, you know, you should give it some of your time because yeah. there are a ton of good games out there and we've played a lot and, you know, we're continuing to try to find more. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's gotta be some sort of a hook, some trope that I like the setting, the art sometimes surprisingly, mm-hmm. like, I, I have, <laughs> I have bought books just mostly because of the art because it's easier to see the art and get an idea of the style that they're trying to go for than it is to read mm-hmm. uh, 280 pages of rules in five minutes while you're deciding whether to make a purchase or not. Yeah, and a lot of the times, it, at least at my local game store, the books are actually sealed up, so you can't just like peruse them and stuff like that. Um, but I did find it interesting because they did, you know, to your point. Um, Jeff, they did talk about like what touch tones they say were like these. These were the things that were. Um, um, these are the games or whatever inspirations we took from for, to form the game, and so you know you're kind of asking yourself, well, if these game, if this game is inspired by these things, maybe I might like this game because these are right. The games I, I I think it shows a level of care that they chose mm-hmm. to take time to invest in some, you know, it, to tell people that. Yeah. Cause I, I, I just do. I, I, think I, I speak highly of it. I, I like it. Cause one of the things I always try to do when I run a game is, especially if it's going to be like more of a campaign game with multiple sessions is like, mm-hmm. I try to give things that inspired me about the game. So they understand kind of what the tone is going to be. Yeah. Um, and I think that's important. Um, I do think some of these choices are a little strange. Um, no. in, in their little list, they're sort of, oh. sort of like spaghetti at the wall, sort like of. What? Um, well, <laughs> um, I didn't read it, so what's yeah. one of the ones that I thought was strange? Was we, oh, pow, what, what, what was we talked about it? Which one did we think? Wild, was Wild Sea was was the one that I mean, Wild Sea's been out for a while, but it's just until the last few months, I don't really hear a ton of people talking about it. Borderlands, uh, they have Borderlands on here, which mm-hmm. is, I mean. It's an epic fantasy style, but it's kind of strange. Yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, I'd, I'd have to say that many of these games, like if you found that you were drawn to these, because, you know, like, table, like I haven't played any 13th Age. I've heard about it, but I haven't played it. Um, but obviously, you know, Dungeons and Dragons being in the middle there, I mean, it has to be there because they even use the word short rest, short rest, long rest and stuff like that as they're playing. Mm-hmm. Um but you know, I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of a lot of these things. Like Slug Blaster, I was surprised to see that on there. Like, honestly. I remember uh, the other one that we talked about as being funny. Uh, which one? Vox, uh, their own shows on here. Oh yeah, the movies and television, The Legend of Vox Machina. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, it's I, true. But I, it, to their point, it is a D and D adventure, not it, so. It's it's a D and D adventure, but the, the tone and the style is like Mm -hmm. all theirs like you know what i mean so i i I think i'm okay with it well and i even if it's like advertising and it's an interesting level of transparency is what i would say like um you know because i because i i would hate like 
what I thought was interesting about the Candela Obscura is that when we took over and we looked at Candela Obscura, like I don't felt like we were very motivated to play it based on its quick start rules. Um, and that's because we had found other games in that specific space that we just, we, we connected with better. I mean, I'll be honest, you know, Candle Obscura had used, had borrowed a lot of mechanics from Basin, um, a lot of mechanics from what, Blades in the Dark. Um, and so it, it just felt like it, it had kind of leaned too closely to those things and just gave you a different setting, in, at least in our opinion. Um, yeah. And so we just never really got the full game to really explore it more fully because, as Jeff had said, it just never hooked us. Um, you know, it never really hooked us, like, because we just never said, oh, well, I'm going to reinvest my time to figure this world out when I could just go play a game of full core and basin. Um, and that's true. Like, Candle Obscura, it had, it had, it was a very rules light system, but it didn't, it wasn't rules light in the right ways. Does that make sense? Like, you can uh -huh. play really rules light games. And I mean, I had run Jeff and his uh, girlfriend through a, 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 what was that game that we had played? Do you remember what that was called? Oh. Rhesus. It was, yeah, Rhesus, the, the best beer and pretzels game ever created. <laughs> but she enjoyed it. And it, it only has like four rules to learn. So. Yeah, and no, we both enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a fun archaeological dig using the lightest rules I could find. So, um, but moving on. Uh, player principles. Uh, be a fan of their character and their journey. That's I think that's a, a common narrative game rules principle and everything like that that you see. Um, spotlight your allies. That's not what I see in too many games. Usually, it's more the games that are, um, you know, it's like spot. You know, like as a GM, you're supposed to try to find a way to spotlight everybody. But I think if the players are actively trying to spotlight them, their peers, that's actually a good a good thing to it you know, include in that as well. That, Look for really, times they can succeed. That really kind of feels like the, uh, the uh, improv, you know, idea mm -hmm. of yes. And mm -hmm. well, you yeah, know, it's, like, like help set up to, to keep things going and give everybody a chance to participate. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's the yes. And, and remembering that they're also like your, your audience to a degree, like your, sure. um, your all kind of performing for each other. So it's important to spotlight each other and, and really, you know, help each other. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's usually covered in like the cooperative storytelling aspect. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's inter it's it's neat that they call it out like that it's your kind of your responsibility as a player to support mm -hmm. the type of game for you, the other players. That's kind of cool. Yeah. No, it's I think it's personally a a, a nice thing to in be inclusive of to set the tone, right? Because I feel that sometimes in like a D D game. You know, if that's if that's your ba if that's your main experience, you may feel like the onus falls on you a lot of the times to create those moments where your players can stand out. And I think it's it's easy to to give them some of the responsibilities to kind of tee it up for each other to have cool moments that they create for themselves. And I think that helps the, the GM because the the game master really needs to you know can't, can't control everything. And I don't. And I think if you force them to to find ways to spotlight your characters, that you might not be getting as much play time as you'd like. <laughs> so right, exactly. Okay, um, that's fair. <laughs> but uh, play to find out what happens. Um, that's very much a powered by the apocalypse type of mentality. You know, don't don't have a set in stone kind of. This is how it's going to be. Period. You know, let the let the narrative evolve and see what happens there. Um, address the characters and address the players. Um, speak to the characters within the world of the fiction, lean on your connections, ask them questions. This is probably the most role play principle out of the sure. group. <laughs> and I mean, you could role play as much as you like. Uh, anybody that's watched any of our previous actual plays knows that we roll, uh, we're very light on the, the, you know, getting super deep into characters and voices and all that kind of stuff. But I don't know. I think we get pretty deep into the characters, like not not having like making voices doesn't mean you're not even the character like That's you guys true. were you guys did very well playing like the delta green characters when you were playing yeah um, i enjoyed that what nathan and steven was that their name? yeah yeah um and you guys played them i mean you guys were into the characters like you could tell the way that you were playing them you were into them as much as any character before and like that was out vo without voices you definitely empathize for the character situations and stuff yeah so. and that's true that's kind of what you're you're looking to do there and but i'm just saying we're not the types that are going to be like doing voices and character acting we're, we're the types that are just going to role play the characters as best as we can and make decisions from their viewpoint 
Um, and then uh, last but not least, or last two is we have hold on gently. I, I kind of think that's an interesting piece of advice is that as a GM, sometimes you might want to see an outcome because you think it's like a cool story point, but to not necessarily hold on so tightly that you don't let the story breathe. Um, yeah, the GM definitely can't hold on to can't hold on to all of his ideas all the time. Yeah, and and sometimes you can't even hold on to the ideas that are important, like which hotel your players stay at. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you have to work around it. And yes, that's a subtle jab. <laughs> you know, like in fairness, the decision, you know, in the heat of the moment made sense. And you handle that so well because I didn't even like I didn't even think about yeah, that we didn't know. after after the end of the game that like it's important that you stay at the hotel where stuff is actually happening. <laughs> Not, okay, now we're gonna go back to our hotel. We'll come <laughs> back here in the morning. I feel like it's one of those things where it's well, like you can stay okay. here. Already paid for those rooms. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's really funny because it's like, okay, in this story, all the creepy stuff happens around the hotel. And it's like, it's imagine people going to the whatever that hotel is in the shining and being like, Oh man, this is pretty far away from town. How about we get a, a place in town and then we come back out here when we need to? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the the movie The Shining doesn't happen. Um exactly. <laughs> I'll come up when I need to tend to the uh, when I need. Yeah, to tend to I'll, the, uh... I'll try to make it up once a week. You know, I'll plow it just so I can make sure I'm up here or get a snow machine because those existed back then. Um, so the last item is uh, build the world together in Daggerheart. Every participant is a storyteller, not the GM. Uh, very collaborative, and I think I think that's where I would enjoy this game a little bit more. And I and based on what you know, the principles are, these are very enticing principles for me to think about in a game. And I, the fact that they've included them, I think aligns with what I would want out of this type of high fantasy game. So, I mean, now I also can caveat, I have not played every high fantasy role-playing game out there. We've, you know, so there may be one that also is good, but I'm just saying based on what we're looking at today. Um, yeah, so I think we could probably look at all the different rules if we wanted to, but I don't really feel like this is where we want to go through. Um, I did want to kind of give an overview of the classes real quick, but then I think I was just going to jump into the actual character creator and then just see how easily it is to make the character. Okay. Um, and so what do you guys think about that? Did you guys have a chance to look over the classes a lot or no? Not a lot, very okay. honestly, titles, you know, to see yeah. and then try and understand how they fit in. Because sure. uh, let, let, let's be honest, I, I was comparing them to D&D classes or Pathfinder classes because those are the standards for the genre. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean they're the only things that have to exist, but, you know, no matter what things are named, they often go back to you know, some sort of iconic type of class that's been around for 50 years. Yeah, the class fantasy. Um, yeah. I think when you're looking at it, I mean, you're, you're, I think you're right. I think what they did do is they gave like, um, they gave it a little bit of flavor. The one thing that I thought was interesting is I didn't see a, um, a quote unquote healer class other than the druid. Um, so what happens is, is when you select a class and everything like that, you notice that it has its domain, Sage and Arcana, Evasion, all of its little things. And then what you have is you have subclasses that kind of tell you where you're going to sit. So let's say you did want to play the Druid, um, is that, you know, if you wanted to play Warden of the Elements, you know, play the, the Elements if you want to embody the natural elements of nature. And that, that description is to kind of give you the more Druidic feel, you know, I am a force of nature, a power to be reckoned with. Whereas a warden of renewal, that's the one that seems to draw upon nature to heal your heal monkey, the, the, the heal monkey, yeah, the party. Uh, but I just thought it was interesting because I didn't see a straight up cleric class that was like, oh, you were a divine practitioner of said god or anything like that. The seraph, I think. It, well, so if you and so the the seraph, you know, basically comes in with two options: a wing sentinel, play the wing sentinel if you want to take flight and strike hard from the sky. Or a divine wielder, if you want to dominate the battlefield with a legendary we weapon. Oh, so it's more paladin than mm -hmm. where? Yeah, and um, I think what was that domain? I think it was this. I think it might be that Seraph has some of that stuff, but I think that there was a. Is it the Splendor domain? I think the Splendor domain is important for that. 
Um, I'll, I'm still reading the rules uh, to kind of get the after first level stuff, um, but we're, we're working on it. Um, but otherwise, the Guardian was like the tanky version. The Warrior was like the fighter version. You didn't have a sorcerer and a wizard. Um, so, you know, you, you still have those kind of distinctions with the, you know, similar as to D&D. You Can know. you look at the Seraph again? Uh, yeah. Because uh, in chat, they just said it's uh, magic. Basically a cleric. It seems more clericky, mm -hmm. which would be interesting because the description definitely seem, seems to be. It mentions a lot about fighting. Yeah, because it's you spend hope to take flight, specialization, you strike fear, divine wielder. Oh, here it is. Sparring touch. So. Oh, do they have like a combat heal where you can attack and heal or something like that? Once per long rest, you can heal a creature and heal two hit points or two stress. Okay. okay. Yeah, I did miss that. That sparring touch or sparing touch. I think it's sparing. Yeah, this, there would be another R. That's my ability to read. So yeah, I mean, it it seems like it might have a little bit of clericiness to it, but I mean, it might be more well, paladin. It kind of feels more like a lay 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 on hands type. Mm -hmm. uh, in chat, they they have a primary feature that lets them help others attack or heal them. Hmm. Well, then how about uh, this? Just let's why don't we go ahead and make a a cleric or that cleric <laughs> a serum. Holy crap. It would, it would be nice to, to, to get into a, a game where, you you know, the parties, everybody's picking stuff and you don't have to be the last. You don't have to worry about being the last one to pick. And then everybody's like, you know, we really need a cleric, man. I will go on record as saying I hate games that make that, ha make that happen. I think I've gone on record as saying that already. Like, everybody <laughs> should get to play what they want. Exactly. They should. I will do I will do as a GM, I will do more footwork to make that not happen. Like I have done when I did play D D a lot, like I would go out of my way to make sure that they had potions and stuff so one of them didn't have to. Well, yeah, right. But there's reasons to play a cleric. Like I've I've played I've played clerics that I, clerics that I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. But it should be everybody should get to choose yeah, if you, what if they want to play. It shouldn't to. have to be the group. Trying yeah. to exert peer pressure to get somebody to do something that I mean, nobody else wanted to do. I've had groups where people played cleric too. He happened to be a war cleric that didn't have a single heal spell, but <laughs> um, but like they, you should be able to do that. And I think I think being should. pulled into that's what I hate. It's an I, option. It's a I've it's a literal option in the book. Hundreds of times, but I hate <laughs> I hate game mm -hmm. games that pigeonhole you into the perfect party mentality. Well, and I think we've discovered on the fourth edition playthrough that there are situations in which the game kind of promotes that and punishes you for not doing it. Well, it just—I um, I think it, re you know, I think it rewards having a different composition than what we had, and I think it, it's also, as we talked about, a game really designed to have more than two people in your party. Mm -hmm. that, that may be the case if you want to um, if you want to maximize your <laughs> so your abilities. So just to kind of, as a side note, if you are playing the uh, the heat that not the healer, if you are playing a character from the pre-generated, you can just select the pre-gen characters for the uh, the one shot. So that's I probably what we're going to ultimately do is select one of these and basically have uh, you. Well, we're probably going to select two of them. Yep, and you'll two. probably have to select Marlo Fairwind if I remember correctly. So no, that, that is what you the, said. That is the required character. So for this. Um, <laughs> This this one we're gonna just create the character Tabris. Um or pronouns they them, who cares? Um there's a picture right here that's the angel level one, and then we hit begin. Ooh, choose an ancestry. So a demon serif. Mmm. Because Brent likes likes the dichotomies. juxtaposition. <laughs> yes. Sure, you don't want a or goblin. a frog, or a frog. Uh, I already made a. I already made a goblin. I already went to that. Um, a frog, frog, frog. It's a ribbit. It's at the bottom. A ribbit. Yep. Anthropomorphic frogs. I did. Mm -hmm. I was impressed by the number of ancestries that they decided to just have right out of the gate. Yeah, game. that's a lot. Right out of the gate. That's a lot. Like mm -hmm. revised Pathfinder gives you a nice, nice choice. A lot less than that. Yeah. 
And I, I, I made this joke with Brent because I was reading fast and the font just made my brain scramble. Your fun girls? Yeah, I was like a furball, a fun girl, a gal galopa. And I was like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely fun girl. Fun girl. <laughs> fun girl. The, the font got me, though, because I think that they have those things when you look, look on Facebook and they're like, oh, your brain can scramble the words into making it something that you know. Uh, yeah, I think so. it's a Freudian slip. That's what I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i want to play with fun girls i guess I don't know. but um yeah so giant goblin halfling um another comment that i i just saw in passing that was kind of interesting is that i didn't seem like they had any gnomes i mean of all the the races to have on here gnomes didn't make the cut well gnomes are probably the less iconic uh mm -hmm. iconic of races because i mean like you have halflings because of the hobbit yeah and elves because of the hobbit but like, mm -hmm. what fiction other than D and D do you think of? I mean, you think of David the gnome if you're old, like well, me. But aren't like um, gnomes pretty common in fiction from like a like a fairy tale perspective? Like, no, oh, I, I I think so, but I think they span a wide range of. But like, can well, what I'm saying is, can you think of a, a, an adventure piece of fiction <clears throat> that had a gnome in it that wasn't D and D oriented, other than David the gnome? If you're old. Hey man, don't set that bar so high on the spot. <laughs> Answer. I didn't. Weren't, no, I don't know. I I think they went out of their way to include a, a surprising amount of anthropomorphic races or mm -hmm. ancestries. Sorry, um, which I think some people really like. So, you know, I, I I don't necessarily look at what's not there. I I try to focus on what is there. That's true. You know Warcraft I mean? Warcraft does have gnomes in it, but. Uh, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty, uh, yeah, pretty, yeah. The viewers thought of it, not you. Um, it's well, true, uh, yeah, whatever. Um, but so there are, there are benefits to choosing a specific ancestry. So, as you can see here, when you choose an ancestry, you get, um, you get, you know, an ancestry ability and all that kind of stuff. Um, verbal resemble cows and humanoid form. What? Yeah, thanks, no, thanks, Brad. I heard that bus coming from chat. <laughs> hey, 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 you're the one that still plays the game. You should have thought of it. I, I haven't played it lately. Uh, lately, my, my drug of choice has been Stellaris. Uh, so I've got, I've been building empires and losing to AIs that that just literally cheat because I don't have to play by the same rules I do. Um, Her blogs look like cows. But, yeah. Well, they have, they have broad noses and long ears. Yeah. Weird. That's a far cry from fur blogs in fiction. Hey, you know what? It's theirs. It's theirs. Um, <laughs> I just saw that. Solaris cheats every time. Ah, I see we have a console user. <laughs> you know what? Sometimes, I'm not going to lie, I, like I've gone, and when you, and this is an off-tangent thing for Solaris because, you know, that's it's just such a fun game, is that you'll like take over a planet and like the planet will have like a 99% crime rate out of 100 and you're like, how does this even function? Like, what happened here? <laughs> so, uh, it's ridiculous. Um, so you said choose choose the demon. No, it's a frog. You... Oh, you said, said uh, we're not choosing frog. We're gonna do a demon. Why not? Is it, do you think they mean demon or demon? It's the same thing, basically. Yeah, whatever. And then, of course, you choose your community: um, highborn, <laughs> lordborn, orderborn, ridgeborn, seaborn, slyborn, underborn. Uh, Wanderborn and Wildborn. Go ahead and pick um, your not, not tiefling. <laughs> well, what's what's interesting is that I think I read when I was reading the um, the actual manuscript, which I thought was a, which they would have just labeled it core book. Um, but I think they basically said is that you can recontextualize these as long as it doesn't affect the mechanics for it. So these are just to kind of give you like ideas as to what kind of communities you would belong to. It's not to say that you would have. Um, I, I think that. Um, you would recontextualize like a, what is it? Uh, an underborn. It's just because you're part of the underborn community, you're part of the underbelly of the the city or whatever that is, or subterranean society in this case. Yeah, you're subterranean. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's not to say that all people that live underground are underborn. You just happen to, you happen to be part of a, a community that is considered an underborn. Correct. Um, order born. Why not? Since we've chosen the seraph. And then order born dedications. 
So, and this is interesting as well because you record three sayings or values in your upbringing that instilled in you once for short rest when you describe how you've embodied one of these principles. You may roll with a D20 as your hope dies instead of a D12. It's kind of nice. Um, virtue. Uh, you mean a role playing game uh, having a rule that reinforces role playing? I know, right? And, but that's during, but, during the least role playing time ever. <laughs> like, but, well, no. Let's let's be, let let's throw ourselves under but, the bus. Our yeah. our long and short rests usually happen at the end of a session with people going, "I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this," and then we're done. And then, right? I, I, like, well, I think we that's don't usually role play those those times. I, I think that's most people with long and short rests, especially in D anD D, because that's the only reason why you would do that. Um. Uh, heavy role playing games. I mean, you might if you have like things that your characters need to discuss, but mm -hmm. like that happens. Uh, that's that's happened pretty regularly. That happened in the Pathfinder game. Um, yeah, where we would do, do we would do out of character stuff. Um, it would never happen in the fourth edition game because you're just like get them hit points back. That's what I'm really caring about. Uh, okay. So speaking of which, now we we've chosen the Seraph here. And so the, okay. the class feature is the prayer dice. At the beginning of the session, roll a number of D4 equal to your spell cast trait and store them to your right. You can exhaust them at any time to use their value in reducing the incoming va damage, um, adding a roll to the result, or exchanging that for that many hope you may give to that any player. Clear these dice at the end of the session. So that that's interesting that that class feature, I don't think I saw that class feature in the... Uh, yeah, you found it. What he was, what they were talking about. He was talking. Oh about. yeah, there is. I just, I, I just overread it. I just ignored it. <laughs> so I was like, "Haha, divine wielder. Ooh, cool swords." Um, so <laughs> yeah, you were thinking, you were thinking, flaming holy swords, not. Uh, and see, there's the problem. <laughs> Ooh, flaming swords. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. I make mistakes. <laughs> so we. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> It's a learning experience. That's why we're going through this. Uh, no, I, I think that's common. Ooh, flaming swords. <laughs> hey, I mean, if, you, if you're going through the list and somebody says divine wielder, I mean, and that's like italicized, that immediately, I don't know what it was, just jumped out at me. I have a problem. Um, subclass, wig sentinels, um, divine wielder. I think we'll go with the divine wielder. You know, play the divine wielder if you want to dominate the battlefield with a legendary weapon. Obviously, I want to dominate the battle with a legendary weapon. Uh, okay, so select this class. Okay, now choose a subclass. Divine wielder. Obviously, it put it up front because it knew what I wanted. <laughs> okay, so we get our spirit weapon. Uh, excellent. Then we got a sparring touch. Excellent. Mike plays the best type of cleric, the one that goes, I don't have any heal spells. <laughs> I'm saving those slots to cast other things. So um, so what you can do is you can either use your selected traits and basically have it select them based on what you've seen in the previous thing, or um, you can go through and it looks like you can use the drop downs here to, to select your oh. traits that way. Um, and I think this is a lot easier. And I I don't feel like this is a I don't feel like this really gives you a lot of like stress over what your ability. No, this feels pretty clean. No, I think that's I think that's I mean there's a little bit of reading to do, but there always is, right? Mm -hmm. you, especially when you're given that many choices. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't break me because you have to take a minus one, it doesn't give me hives to think that like that's on my sheet like dnd &D does like as like i can't take a minus to anything yeah and so it populates these traits up here and and what's interesting is i i mean i that negative one i don't think it's going to be hugely impactful but it basically it's saying like you just have something you're really good at some two things you're decently good at and one thing you're just not as good at this is not your thing yeah yeah it's just yeah. not your thing so obviously as being that i'm from the divine knowledge is not my thing Think for myself. What's that, bro? He's a bro cleric. <laughs> bro. Um, cleric bro. Okay, so here it says it suggests that I use a hollowed axe and a round shield. Oh, okay. Well, let's go ahead with the a, a 
I, I like this though. A tier zero magical weapon. What? I get a I get a magical weapon right out of the gate. So you can see it does. It, it is tier yeah, zero. Yeah, they do. Like, like so I would I would I would uh, calm my expectations, but no, you should be excited about that because if, if Mike's ever running this game, that's the only one you're ever going to have. Yeah, Mike will be like, "What are you talking about? You had a you had a magical weapon right at the beginning. Why would I need to give you any more?" Jeez, oh, <laughs> well, you've already I, got you've already got a thousand times more than you've gotten in all the rest of my games that you've played combined. That's not true. I've given out <laughs> magic weapons as when instructed by the uh, adventure. When, when I, I okay, Mike, I, I want I names and America. dates. I, I want I want to know who to and when because I don't I, think it's ever been me in any game. But, but but I do remember you reading the treasure that we got in a canned adventure, and you going, "This doesn't seem right. This is too much." It just felt like I was giving, a, like I felt like those people just like tossing candy. Oh, it's like take seventeen gems, take just, just like kids at a parade, man. They just, just the candy's just flying, right? All right, which is really funny in a canned adventure because the canned adventure expects you to have those magic items in the next event in the next part of the adventure. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, so let's see. Does it tell you what the uh... Does it, it doesn't look like it tells you what the magical um, components and all that kind of stuff. So use, you can use physical weapons to attack your foes. If you have spellcasting traits such as from your, cap, your subclass, you can also wield magic weapons. So does that mean I have a spellcasting trait to be able to choose this? Instructions unclear. Because I think that there's, I think when you look at like a, um, a like another class, like the... Uh, Let's go with just the sorcerer because that'll be the cleanest, and I I obviously won't miss it as easily as I did the giant. This is the healing class on here. Um, okay, so domains, arcana and midnight, starting evasion score, arcane sense, channel law power. Okay, so see, in this case, this is a spell casting trait. Does Seraph had the spell casting trait? I don't know. Well, I, I assume it wouldn't give you uh, a magic item if it required it. Oh, spellcasting trait strength. Yep, so it does have a spellcasting trait. Okay, perfect. So that's why I can use the magic weapon there. Excellent. That's why I'm going to be using this really impressive hollow axe. Sounds good. Now choose starting armor. Now this is where I think... Uh, this is where it's going to be a lot more fun because now here's here's the the question that I would have for you guys. So they have an armor score of nine, very heavy, minus two to evasion and minus one to agility. Um, or you'd have just your breastplate plate armor. I, I you know I'd be really curious to see how it felt between these because in this case your armor score really is is what you use to mark off. Um. You, your armor score is what you use to mark off your damage incoming, right? So you'd be able to mark off a lot of damage incoming, but if, you, if you're taking a lot of hits, I think that might lose its its effectiveness pretty quick, right? Or what do you think? Yeah, uh, it might. I mm -hmm. Not having played it and only seeing an overview of that part of the rules, it's a little hard to comment. Because yeah, you only really cool. have three armor slots, so, I mean, you could... right. Reduce three times by nine at a minus two to evasion and a minus one to agility. Yeah, there should be a penalty if you're, you know, putting that much stuff on. Well, that's interesting because um, I said I made a sorcerer earlier, a goblin sorcerer, and like you get less, like I think I could only pick one armor slot. One armor. Yeah, you, yeah, so, you, that's interesting. Well, maybe I wonder if that's what it just allows you to choose there. So why don't we choose the selected? Well, why don't we choose full? Well, no, I mean, like it means that it means characters with heavier armor, or maybe more strength, they get more opportunities to take armor. Like my sorcerer could take a breastplate, mm -hmm. um, which it's suggested as the armor to take, um, but it can I don't think you could take anything else. Yeah, so you can use armor to reduce incoming damage from attacks. You choose one piece of armor and equip it if you wish. I'm just going to carry around the full plate in my pack, um, but you can choose any from all starting tier zero armor 
That reminds me of a character I made in an Exalted game who had a giant anime sword that was super badass that he couldn't use, so he just carried it around all the time on his back. It guts but couldn't use the weapon. Exactly. Yep. Okay, so minor health potion and minor stamina potion, so immediately clear 1d4 hit points or 1d4 stress. Ooh. Nice. Mm, I'll take this stamina stress. I do, I, you know, with some of the terms and everything like that and the way that I'm choosing this, I feel like I'm playing more Diablo than I am <laughs> something else. But well, character yeah. generator definitely will make No, I mean, I mean, the game's just, I mean, the game, the rules are constructed a little different, so it's going to feel different than something that we've yeah. fully played. Yep. So starting inventory, I did take, because you do choose one of these bundle of offerings or sigil to your god. I chose the sigil to the god. And uh, you come those... up items. Did you see that too? If you go back up? Mm-hmm. You it shows you you take, yeah, yep. Basic supplies and a handful of gold, and I think that's really nice when they hand. That is super nice. Yeah, I'm not a big I'm not a big fan of like having to micromanage that. Yeah, that was that was one of the things that kind of sucked about. uh, I also sucked about creating characters in 4e was when it was like pick all your starting options, and you're like. Do they not just have like an adventurer's pack where I can say I have? No, they did though. I mean, I took it, it, but they did in the character generator. Right. They did not in the book. I thought it was in the book. I just thought it was in a weird spot. In the book, it was hard to find. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, (laughs) there were a lot of things in the book that were hard (laughs) to find. In my opinion. (laughs) The problem may have been me. So. Well, no, because like I said, I don't remember it being there um, at all. Well, I'm just just saying the second you say that, somebody goes into the comments and says... What do you mean? I I found everything I needed in the book just fine. Okay, uh, I, I'm happy for you. We struggled. Yeah, no one has corrected us on that at all. Like we've been <laughs> called out for some things, but no one has ever said uh, the four. Uh, it was the best. The best four books were organized book beautifully. They uh, had some. We we talked about it. They had some nice parts, but some of the yeah. organization was odd. Hey man, as a guy who was trying to reread it after so many years, I was like, uh, it hurts my brain to have to go to all these different sections. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so domain decks. Uh, so basically, as it says, a, do- a domain deck is a deck of cards that contain a set of abilities and spells that are with a central theme or focus. Um, every class is combined two of these domains. And what you'll find that every class shares its domains with at least one ev- other class. So blade is shared between guardian and warrior. Sage is shared between druid and ranger. Grace is shared between bard and rogue. Uh, okay. And so if a fellow player's class is the same domain as you, you're encouraged to coordinate with them and choose different cards from that domain deck, even if your crew has multiple copies. Um, and that's and I like that idea is that, you know, you don't basically have carbon copies of the same character um, and that you kind of selectively do that. Even if you find that there's one um, domain card that you really like, you know, maybe negotiate with that other person that you take it rather than they do that instead is- of. It gives you a broader range of response. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not again exactly sure how the the cards are used or when they're used, but mm-hmm. I uh, more coverage I think probably helps out and allows for more role playing mm-hmm. than you know everybody having the one semi broken thing because that's why everybody mm-hmm. chose those classes, right? I'm not saying that exists in the game, but we've all seen that in other systems. Yeah. So to answer your question, Jeff, like the 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 actual domain cards that can vary quite differently as to what they are. Um, as you can see on the screen here, it's my understanding that they have like a level associated with them, and then it shows the, okay. sim- the the symbolism for that domain. In this case, we're in the the Valor domain, um, and then of course it talks about like its loadout versus vaulting it, which I thought was. Um, which I thought was a, an interesting term to include is that basically you have a loadout of domain cards. And I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there was five domain cards that you can have when you're a higher level. So like eventually you max out of active domain cards that you can be using. And then you have okay. this vault where the rest of your domain cards go. And at so, some appropriate time you can make substitutions or changes. Um it, it, I think Rarely it probably. I think it's like during your downtime you can make changes okay. to those or you can spend stress. I believe this that's what this icon was for is that you spent stress oh, okay. out or something like that. That's no, um, that's cool. I, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to learning all the rules and getting to play with some of these things and seeing it, you know, how they feel as mechanics. 
Did you actually, I mean, so in terms of like Gloomhaven, and that was something that came to me as I was thinking about this today, is how does this compare to like a Gloomhaven style game? Because you guys played that. I wasn't cool enough to have a group that took me through Gloomhaven, but did it, does it feel like you're, you built loadouts in Gloomhaven kind of like this, or is that entirely different? Uh, you did a little bit because you had a deck of abilities that you randomized, but you got to pick, you know, like what went into it. Mm -hmm. And you could change that yeah. at times. And when you leveled up, you got to add cards to your deck. So th th there was a certain amount of that. This seems much more focused mm -hmm. and less random. Yeah. But uh, I mean, you had a hand, right, Brent? I'm. Uh, you, you had your yeah. deck, but you you had you a had certain your, number that you. You had your yeah. hand of action cards that you could yeah do, like your hand of abilities. But like it was much more gamey than this because like mm -hmm. basically your hand of cards is like how long till your character die or passes out. So it was much more gamey on like how to use the cards and stuff like that. So it doesn't really remind me of that too much. Um mm. like this is pretty uh like because every time you when in Gloomhaven, every time you played a card, like once you rifled through your hand, once you had to discard a card and to refresh your hand. Mm -hmm. So like if you have a like a 10 card hand like you basically have you know that many turns before it's going to turn into a problem mm -hmm. um so so yeah it's, it's much more game it's much more granular and gamey than that so it doesn't remind me of that very much and you don't really make a character like you don't really make a character in gloomhaven you have pre-generated characters okay so i think it's a i, I think i mean i mean any i mean any i would say <laughs> Fourth edition feels more like Gloomhaven than than this does. Um, okay, because it's more of a tactical map sort of thing. But um, yeah, sure. So well, and I think uh, that's fair. I was just curious because I'd never really played the game. And no, I it's felt a good, like... it's, no, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good question because what I mean, like when you when you see these games that involve more like cards that sort of feel like they have kind of a deck building element. Mm -hmm. You, you got to wonder what's the difference between Gloomhaven, and I think Gloomhaven has zero role playing in it, and I think this uh, this uh, encourages that pretty much at every level. Your domains are just things that your character can do and yeah. define your character. Like, mm -hmm. like you have a very defined character in Gloomhaven that really doesn't like they they may have specific abilities, but they're very one dimensional. Like these this these are these build a, a very multi dimensional character. I think. Yeah, and what I was surprised by is when I'm looking through these different cards here, they look like they have quite a bit of difference in terms of, like, I mean, it, it's all thematically in a certain way, but you could mm -hmm. have a very different character depending on the type of loadout that you chose. Like, you could easily, you know, choose like a, I don't know, you could choose Bolt Beacon to have, um, treat it like a ranged weapon dealing magic damage, so you go around shooting, you know, beams of light at people, why not? Um, or you could take a more defensive build. You know, mm -hmm. you could take the, in this one it says, like, I'm an, when an ally is close to you, it's going to take damage. You may mark stress to stand in its way and take the damage instead. Reduce the damage by a value equal to your strength trait. And you may also reduce the damage by spending armor slots. Yeah, in this, uh, one thing I'll add is in this, the, the, like, cards seem more like a convenience rather than a contrivance. Like, they, mm -hmm. they, they're, you don't need them. Um, they're just kind of convenient to have. To keep mm -hmm. track of things, but you you could play the game without them. Yeah, well, and 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 it, like I said, as you're building it through the Dagger Heart Nexus, you know, as it's going through and bringing everything together. So I think that's the main gamey component to it. Like all that are the mechanical, uh, the main mechanical stuff. You know, so we chose a, a heritage, an order born demon. <laughs> we chose our class. Which is this, uh, a divine wielding seraph, and then here are your here are your descriptions. In this case, I, it wasn't as clear that you would just type loads, basically just type in a. a it, but like the 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 text there gives you ideas of what to type mm -hmm. in, which yeah. I, I thought was very helpful. But you can make them look like whatever you want. I think that's pretty cool. Um, it, on a character sheet, it just says you like select one, but this gives you a little bit more freedom than that. Mm -hmm. A body that is, I don't know, body that is celestial. Sure. Uh, oh, no, because they're a demon, there would be a body that is. I think they want like a descriptor, like red is evil. a ruby. 
or you know, <laughs> the body that is dangerous. Um, yeah, a, a, a body that is an eldritch horror. Um, toned, because that's one of their things. The color of obsidian, an attitude like a uh, what is that? Um, uh, fervent believer. Fervent yeah. believer. Yeah. I just, so, I just, I just realized uh, you can make a flying frog uh, as the seraph. Uh, I'm, I'm vaguely excited about that. <laughs> hey man, <laughs> this game allows you to get you onto the table, and if it's you want to be little, a flying frog, it's, it's the little things, everybody. It's the little things. <laughs> Oh geez, uh, I love it though. I'd love to see. Like there was a, I think it was Chrono Trigger. I think there was a frog in there, Glenn. Very formative in my in my younger years. Um, yeah, they talk about. I think I think I watched some. Like, there's something with one of the frog. I think it's Chrono Trigger where there's one of the frog characters that you need to get something special in one of the games. I've watched. I've seen it on some of those like impossible shit people find in games that no one really knows. No one really oh. do, knows about. Yeah. Well, we have a friend that like mastered that game. So if anybody wants to trivia that, it's going to be him. Because I mean, I think that because it had a new game plus, and you kept on kicking your character through it, and he mm -hmm. was he was determined to find like this was before a hundred percent was like a thing. He was determined to like a hundred percent the game, right? Because this is back when it was on like the Super Nintendo, you know, so, back when you can't tell what hundred percenting actually meant. Yeah. Unless... So so I think if I remember correctly, all I could say is that they were like once you maxed out the character, they got stars instead of attributes. Like I think he had stars in every attribute. Oh, and I was like, How much have you played this game? And he's just like, Yes. I have. <laughs> so um back to the background questions. You know, who is the god that you have devoted yourself to and what incredible feat did they perform for you in a moment of desperation that made you feel indebted to him? Ooh. So an actual divine intervention i'm not going to worry about that right now hopefully there'll be gods in the world that they um so you're not putting like paylor who's a D, &D god uh well i don't think you would but let's see <laughs> uh, uh religion uh i uh, so i just want to point this out i was gonna say jesus uh, is what I was going to say, but uh, thank you, uh, Matthew, for saying it for me. I appreciate that. <laughs> Finger guns Jesus from from Dogma. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Hmm. Running campaign, planning an arc, building a map, leveling a party's location. Yeah. I have some locations. Yeah. Um, I don't really have a setting in this, I guess. And maybe they, they left that out for obvious purposes. Uh you know, because they want uh, yeah, time. they haven't released. I don't think they really, they've released that. that yet. Buddy Christ. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's good. That's good. There was a. I, I read Dungeon Crawler Carl, and there were some pretty uh, funny characters that came from that as part of a weird card game in the in the Bedlam Bride book. Um, uh, how did your own appearance change after taking your oath? TBD. Okay, a strange god, a strange or unique way do you communicate with your god? It's a very personal question. Yeah, so I'm I'm sure like some of these <laughs> questions. The, most religious questions are uh, terribly terribly personal. But I mean, the idea would be is that I'm sure once you had a little bit more understanding of the setting and all that stuff, you could fill these in quite well and give yourself some basic role playing fodder. Like I, I kind of like these kind of directed questions for the background. Um, what do you guys think? Is this something? No, I like the I like I like direct questions like this. I usually even in games that don't like one of the things that I did for my Shadowrun game is that we would do the twenty questions, which is like you have a sheet of twenty questions that you pass around the table and you have people answer about their character to kind of flesh them out. Mm -hmm. um, like you know, uh, you know what happened to your parents, which they're all dead, but. Um, so that's not really a good question to put on your 20 on your 20 questions but um you know what do you do for fun you know stuff like that yeah i think that there was like a i think it might have been a fate mechanic that talked that basically had like a collaborative background set up and everything like that so i mean it's good i just i like the idea 
and this is the part that I also felt was a lot like fate was the generate experience. Um, because you, you basically choose two things and then you will use those. Um, yeah. And it's, it's how you mechanically apply them. And if it's anything like fate, your goal is to apply them as much as possible, not as little as possible. Yeah. You want they're, something. Yeah. They're character defining. So you want them to be what drives your character as much as possible. Yeah. And it's um, like a sweet spot. You don't want them to be so impossible to apply that they just never can be used. Like, oh, I want my experience to be like um, street urchin rat catching. And, you know, like I'm a rat catcher and we happen to be in a in the sea, you know, or maybe that would work. I don't know. But you know what I'm saying? Like, you don't want it to be so limiting that you can't use it. But on the other end, it can't just be like it can't be like one punch man. And you say like one punch kills or something, I think is what they <laughs> what they had selected. So you can't be like, I get a plus two every time I, I attack someone because I kill them in one punch. Yeah. Mur murder, murder, death kill is my. Yeah. Name. Yeah. Oh, they said one hit kill. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't really have it. You don't want it to be mechanically oriented. You want it to be something that's this. So uh, devout follower. So you could say something like devout follower. And what I would what I would hope that that would do is that would in, that would inform the whoever's running the game that if it's a religious related question or something like that, um, you'd be able to use that in those types of scenarios. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, follower. Or uh, zealot. Zealot would be another good one. Oh yeah, zealot. Uh, how do you spell zealot? Zeal. <laughs> You're asking the wrong person. Zealous. <laughs> lit. Zealous. And it's maybe zealot. Z e l o t e. Zealot. Z e a l o t. Oh, oh. I forgot a letter. Uh, thank you for the chat. We, uh, <laughs> thank you. Because because it wasn't spell checking me. Uh, I am a man. See, it of, just it just didn't even like it was just I'm like a man oh, of problematic spelling. problematic spellings. That's okay. Um, then the second experience, you could say like uh, I don't know something that is. I mean, you could just use like that special issues like magical historians, divine. I don't know, Divine Warrior, I don't know, something like that, Divine Warrior 1. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I think that this is interesting, and I think that you can expand on this, and they even suggest that if your experience isn't really making sense, that you change it down the road, because they want you to have this background component ins insertable more often than not, and I like that practice. I think it's nice. It gives you a little yeah, bit. it is nice. Um, it's funny because I remember really struggling with fate because uh, mm -hmm. I felt like I was trying to overuse everything. Um, and like, I felt like I was being very meta and it's like, no, you're supposed to do that. Yeah. Um, and like, it was very hard for me to, it was very hard for me at first, the first few times I, I, I played a fate game to uh, mm -hmm. like use the abilities. So that, that's kind of, an, that is an interesting thing. I like that. Yeah, and I don't know. Um, Jeff, it will make you? the game. It will make the game feel different. Like that'll be something that feels a lot different than your standard D and D game. Yeah, because you, you basically flesh them out on the fly too. Because you'll you'll all of a sudden add story points to your character as to why that would make sense. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of neat. But Jeff, what about you? Do you? I mean, experiences so far. What are your thoughts on all this stuff? Uh, I, I the character creation process seems uh, pretty nice. I, I like the direct questions. Um, I th it makes you think about the character that you're creating beyond how much damage can I do when I hit things, um, which I think is a plus for role playing. Uh, it it helps you understand the character, develop the character. Uh, so I I don't know I've I've liked the process so far. And honestly, I'd, I'd say that more of my my most <clears throat> memorable games, I can't remember that they, they were very combat heavy games. Truth be told, and is is that what you guys kind of experience in your memory banks? Like, because I mean, I I mean, every once in a while you have that game where you're like, oh, and we took down a Tarask or some other legendary creature. I mean, that that's pretty memorable by itself. But like for the most part, my games aren't like, oh, and we killed fifty two goblins. 
Uh, no, most of the most of the memorable things from my D and D games are. Um, uh, I remember the epic failures that occur more than anything. Like mm -hmm. uh, my my rogue failing a in three point five, my rogue failing a dex check, which had plus twelve to it, and getting incinerated by a lightning bolt. <laughs> Uh, like that sort of stuff, I remember. I don't usually remember when I win. Um, frankly, maybe it's because it's rare. I don't know. Um, but there'll always uh, be the time with the owl bear. That's, all I <laughs> there, that's another good one where you know subduing the owl bear didn't work the best. Um, but I, most of the time, if I remember combat, it's because something creative happened. Well, mm -hmm. kind of like the owl bear, where it's like <laughs> we'll let the owl bear out so it can take care of everything in the in the in the when the castle well how are we gonna get out we'll pass that bridge when we come to it <laughs> sometimes you gotta set it free man or yeah. you know or you know the you know walking up to a goblin looking like a goblin and then the goblin speaking goblin being a surprise you know that sort of stuff that's not combat but that's that's the stuff that's memorable usually that was my favorite he's talks to you at goblin corbin just <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, and then like you know, fights you can't win, like the pig, where we couldn't fight the pig in the basin <clears throat> game. Like, yeah. So I, I mean, there are definitely are, are memorable combats, but they're not memorable because of it being a combat. Usually, I don't think. <laughs> um, and again, when so much of the combat becomes you're just swinging your sword, um, you know, or eldritch blasting. Life. I mean, if you were to if you were to calculate how many times you Eldritch Blast in those three encounters, oh, and... it must have been three hundred times. Like it was, it was a lot. It was a lot. Uh, well, the combat and the combat, the combat with the robots in the Pathfinder game is memorable. Mm -hmm. Like the the Clockworks, that was memorable. And then the combat with um, the Odiug was memorable. And then the combat with um, combat. No, that's it, not because uh, they were combats. That was, again, those are, <laughs> exactly. Those are that's entirely different. That's the, what the I'm saying. Is they're combats, but they're not like they're memorable because they're comments with a purpose like and that's what i and that's one of the things i and i'm gonna bag on fourth edition again here in a minute uh right now actually and that's what i say this problem with and that's one of the problems with fourth edition is the fourth edition combats don't feel memorable for that reason most of the time they usually just feel like yeah it'll just blasting things all the time yeah that was a lot of elders blast but yes jeff you uh <laughs> you were saying no i I have I have had memorable campaigns that involved involved a lot of combat, but it's mostly because memorable things happen within those combats. Mm -hmm. Not every combat has memorable things. Some of the combats that go on forever, the only reason you remember them is because it felt like you were pushing a rock up a hill and it was sliding back. You know, they they were, you know, not fun. So. I think having options, being able to do interesting things, or at least things that you find interesting, help make them memorable. And having a system that allows a certain amount of freedom around the combat, I think helps. I, I, st I still haven't really played a D&D &D game that was a great political intrigue one, even though, you know, people say that you can do it, mm -hmm. um, you know, where there's little to no combat. And you probably can it's it's in the hands of the dm and the players you know what i mean yeah. but i, I i'm not anti-combat i like combat um a, a lot of the you know there's a power fantasy here and a lot of that's fulfilled through combat yeah. with other powerful creatures well and, um, i mean that's how D D is like that's that's like what you're teeing up is usually the epic confrontation against the thing like yeah. nobody goes into nobody goes into like strad to go have tea with strad i mean i guess you could but you know you're <laughs> But that I think most people might be a better idea with Strahd as being, you know, kind of a I'll maneuver physical. him in a best of nine chess series, yeah, <laughs> over the next month. Yeah, I mean, hey, you know what? It's hey, Ravenlock, it really can go any way, but I'm just exactly. saying, is that the, the expectations there is that you and Strahd are going to face off at some point, like a like a like I don't know, I, I playing a DD entry game of DD makes me. It's it's one of those th those thoughts that makes me say it makes me think if you're gonna play a D and D game with no combat why are you why are you playing a D and D game, um, yeah, and maybe well, it's because that's all they have or that's the rule set that they enjoy if or, that, or they've got there. a party of players that they've been playing together yeah. for but I just years. think I just think there's I just think there's there's like 
there's games that where your political intrigue could have mechanical benefits that might be more mm -hmm. fun um like rain where you can actually do something with a kingdom um based on your political intrigue like that stuff i think would add it adds to it whereas i don't think D, &D necessarily does that doesn't make D, &D a bad game it just i just think there's no. sometimes better options S yeah. systems systems have strengths and weaknesses right yeah or yeah. areas that they excel in and areas yeah that are more challenging and yeah. and they but they do color I, I will always say that the rules do color the type of game that you play and so a gm will really like a gm is really thinking outside the box if the, like if you had a person that was playing 4e and they were doing a so you know a political intrigue game like they're thinking way out of the box that what that game provides for you <laughs> I if well, you are one of those DMs. I want to. I want to play a session. And see what it's like. Well, but I think in those <laughs> you cases, you are more creative than me. I think you can do it again. You know, I I've always run into that thing where you know role players that want to role play don't like the the rules matter less. It's just that there yeah. are some games that obviously enhance it versus that don't. And I but there are role players that will lean a certain direction. Like I said, mm -hmm. myself for an example, like I will make characters that aren't good at things intentionally. Um, because that's a character that I want to play, yeah. but it's hard in a D and D game because I know if the D and D game is going to be half combat, I'm going to either not be doing anything or just suck for the entire combat. And you can be bad at things that aren't combat, and it's like, demoralizing. The main trust of the game, but I mean, like it's, it's but it's demor but yeah, but it's demoralizing. Like like remember that character that I played in your Starfinder game, which is like based on like a buffing other people, kind of mm -hmm. like in any in. And he wasn't very good because he wasn't, and so he wasn't very good at combat. But then it turned out he wasn't really very good at buffing other people either. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that no, might have been a fundamental misunderstanding of how to <laughs> play that guy. But... but but that's what but that's what I'm saying is like I I kind of kind of picked him to do something different than fight things, right? And mm -hmm. then I was like, well, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, because I also think that, I think it would have required greater party cohesion. Too. Um, but I won't talk about that one. <laughs> so let's actually finish up this character sheet before we devolve into uh um <laughs> so the uh the create connections you know what promise did you make me agree to should you should you die on the battlefield um what do you ask me why do you ask me so many questions about my god who have you told me is more important to save here than yourself i mean they're just interesting questions and what you do with these um once you've like finished up and everything like that uh, you work to you work together to ask these questions of certain other players. So in our playthrough, obviously, I mean, I don't I don't know how deep we'll get. We'll see. We've had fun with um, narrative games and all that stuff. But you would basically ask this question of another person. So Jeff could ask, um, "Why do you ask me so many questions about my God of Brent?" And Brent can say, "Well, it's because I'm playing a Kender, um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm and I'm on an unlimited well of questions." <laughs> so. Uh, this reminds me of uh, the questions in um, Connections. This is definitely from uh, Powered by the Apocalypse games, mm -hmm. um, and we did this. We did this similarly did. in the uh, yeah in the Mo Monster of the Week game. Like, how are we connected? Mm -hmm. What are what are you know? Oh, and Vas and Vason has this too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, yeah, this... and I think, but it's a, but it's a good system. And I and I guess yeah. the question is, is that do the does this amalgamation of mechanics and everything like that create a system that is fun to play and i mean i i think as it was said by somebody else is that does it does it really start to affect the indie market share for people to be excited about this game to play instead of their D, &D game you know because D, D has a stranglehold on this and everybody knows that you know D, &D is the elephant in the room and, and we've said it a lot i mean we're not here to promote D, &D. we'll play some here and there um but I'm I'm kind of curious as to can I get a D and D fix from a non D and D game? Good question. So uh, as you can see, that's how easy it was. And if we didn't if we didn't go through this, um, you know, with kind of a lot of side quests as we talked about a bunch of different things, I mean, you can create this character very quickly, um, and it has all the information, so you can kind of read along as you need to, so you can kind of understand what you're doing and all that kind of stuff. Um, leveling up seems pretty easy. I did find that interesting that they also chose a 10 level scale, you know, to kind of match the MCDM 10 level. That's because 20 levels is ridiculous. I think people should just just what about 30 levels? I think people about? should just I think people should just admit that that 10 level like 20 levels is a bit ridiculous. 
Well, then, I mean, even Fallout had an obscene number of levels that you could get to. Like, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I don't, I don't know, like leveling up is always such an interesting thing to me because it's like 10, 10, 20, 30. I don't know. It just feels like 10 is a good number and I'll be curious to see. And I think, I think you'd mentioned it before that like, I mean, when we were looking at the D and D beyond average level, it's like, ah, make a level 20. No point. Oh yeah. It was like four to six or something like that. Right. Like yeah. or, or fifth was, level. Like was somewhere in the fifth level range was about as far as people ever made. So, uh, but as you can see, when you, when you level up, you can actually create an additional experience. You increase your damage threshold, you can level up options and you can choose a domain card. So you actually do quite a few things at level up. And I actually think it does a, um, you kind of see it a little bit better on the PDF. So I'm going to go over to that real quick. Um, and so you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, it has your tiers of play uh, where you can see like at level two, take an additional experience. And then when you level up recorded on your character sheet, then choose two available options from the list below and mark them. So what you do is you slowly fill out these check boxes to basically say, okay, well, increase the two unmarked character traits by one and mark them. And what they mean by that is they mean up in the, the trait section, they mean actually put like an X or something next to that. Um, and then you actually clear your traits when you reach the next tier of play. And so you can kind of, you, you can actually see your traits increase over time. So they're not just kind of stuck in one place that they have there. So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, and then you get to see your character sheet on the page uh, right here. So then you can go character sheet. Ba -bum. It is a pretty graphically intensive website, though. I did notice that. I know. I, I mean, I don't have a supercomputer, and obviously my desktop died. But I mean, I just, I just dig the art that they have going for it. Um, art. Yeah, the style. character sheets are nice. The character sheets are nice. Yeah. Yeah, it looks good. Of course, the first time I looked at this, I forgot. I was like, "Why am I only doing one d four physical on my unarmed? Why can't I actually attack with weapon?" I had to figure out how to like equip weapons and. And do a bunch of other things so there's still a little bit of learning curve and obviously you know i you know i i was i was saddened that i only had one hand full of gold you know need to have more obviously um so i make that my hollowed axe and my round shield and my full plate armor okay there now my character oops now my character. oh you have to you have to equip equip the stuff that yeah sense. you have to go in and equip it otherwise it looks pretty weird so now you can see I have, um, you know, my evasion of five, my armor of eleven. So, and that's kind of one thing that I'll be I'll be curious to kind of get your guys' opinions of is because I what what I thought was strange is that there's the duality dice that you guys roll for your hope of fear, and then I roll a d twenty when I'm doing stuff. I thought that was strange. I could that be is wrong. Kind of strange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe they, maybe they had to have a reason to still have the d twenty in their logo. Maybe. On critical role. God. That's that's a little bit of a pessimistic view. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. Uh sure, sure. Um, but yeah, there it is. So I think I don't know. I feel like, you know, with a little bit of practice, I don't feel like this would be too challenging to navigate. I'll just be really curious to see exactly how liquid this hope is. They kept on mentioning it as a liquid currency, but I'll be really curious to see how fast and quickly you spend it. What a weird, we'll, we'll, what a weird, we'll learn that when we're playing. I mean, yeah. but the, the tool itself, like, you know, the character creation, I thought was pretty slick, actually, given that it's essentially a beta, you know, all things mm -hmm. subject change, right? Yeah. No, they did really good in terms of just, like, having this ready for for release um, in, in time with the beta, the, the open play test. So... Honestly, I feel like this was the this is the right move for him because I I don't I don't mind character sheets, but I play so much online, and I'd be curious to what other people's proportion of online games are because it it feels like when you want to play a new game, go into your local friendly game store. If you have a core group that's like excited to try that, great. But if you don't, you have to almost go online, and find some people, random strangers on the internet. So, and we're random strangers on the internet, but they don't have to be. <laughs> you can stop by our stream on Mondays. Say hi. <laughs> so um, that's it. I mean, that's character stuff. Did you guys have any major things that like jumped out and said, I don't like this or things that you wanted to highlight as, as peak 
for that, or are you guys? I think we kind of did that as, as we were going along. I, yeah. did, did you have anything additional, Brent? I didn't. Fur blogs as cows is still weird, but that's more of a, an aesthetic opinion. Um, uh, no, I think I think it's it's pretty straightforward. Character creation is pretty straightforward. It is similar enough to D anD D to feel pretty comfortable mm -hmm. with some things that um, make it different, which I think is nice. Um, even and yeah. even stuff that would be home rules for D anD D games, like the like the questions on how you you know how you feel about your stuff, like that stuff that you might home rule in a D anD D game. So that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, from for, through the character creation, I'm I don't know. I have a little bit of hope that it, it'll be fun to play. It'll be fun to play, and not just be fun to play because like I have fun playing with you guys, but fun to play because I enjoy the rules. Yeah, I mean that's the that's the tricky part right now is that even in our home table we haven't um, we haven't really stuck with a game for super long. I mean we played Pathfinder for what five months maybe? Six yeah, five or six months. months. Yeah, that we was played Basin for time. three four months. Yeah, I mean. But I mean, we're not. I don't think. I don't think anybody should have a. I, like, I, I heard this today on the internet when I was listening on the internet. Why did I say it that way? Um, <laughs> just, I was we were just walking around on the internet. I was listening to Indestructo Boy talk about this game, and one of the things he said at the beginning of his broadcast at the beginning. For those of you who don't know, Indestructo Boy is another YouTuber who is making his own game, and he and he un analyzes content like us. Um, I don't know. Maybe he's better at it. I don't know. Um, better at it. Uh, I'm not going to say that. But anyways, we're, we're everyday gonna, gamers. I think he's an actual game designer. So, uh, well, I mean, he's designing a game. I don't necessarily know if that makes you a game. I mean, I guess it does technically in theory, but that doesn't mean it's good. Uh, but anyways, I don't know anything about his game. I'm not talking bad about him. Stop trying to make me sound bad. What I was saying was, um, an instructor boy said, "I really wish people would stop trying to have their forget ever game." because like there's so much out there that you should just experience so i don't think anybody should have one well, game that they play just constantly all the time i like that we have a variety well i do too it's more that it's like i i don't want to say forever game and more what i'm saying is i wish you had that grand campaign does that make sense like that's that's more the wish that people had is that you know i mean we have that grand you know multiple minor arc spanning game that from front to back was a was a terrific time and i i haven't had a really long campaign in a while so i don't mind playing these shorter games because as long as i'm telling stories and having fun with you guys i mean you know you can we we will never forget our time with the noble odio that got shot prematurely because of our the noble duel with dishonorable the character the on our side um, but you know what I'm saying? Like those, like telling fun but, stories is the part of the game. But I just, I'm, I'm always, I think there's always that part of me that wishes I had that. Yeah, there's always. I think anybody is. I think anybody who GMs or plays as a hobby, like we do, like you always think, man, I wish I had that game that lasted for years. Um, uh, but I, and, and that'd be an epic game, and my character would be so cool. But like, I've kind of adjusted my my like sights on what an epic game is now, especially for running. Like, I think if you run a game for six months to a year, like that game is pretty epic. Um, uh, well, look at this guy in the comments. Show off. <laughs> How long? <laughs> well, look, wow. Let's just say we're super envious of you because that is I, no, awesome. I am. That's 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 one of those bucket list things. I think I talked about it a few episodes ago. It's yeah. it's one of those I've always wanted to be part of that. Whether I'm built to be that committed to one thing, because I, you know, after a while I tend to need breaks, but mm -hmm. I, I admire it. I admire the hell out of it. That the yeah. the GM still being involved, the players all still being involved, that's impressive. Yeah, I can only think of a few characters that I'd want to play for that long. Well, I do, I'm actually curious. Just if you don't mind answering, was this a homebrew adventure, or was this um, like a string together of like established uh, modules or something like that? Oh, <laughs> well, no. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, I'm not calling you a psycho, but definitely the ability to organize and make people show up is, is a big thing. That's oh. impressive. No, it's it's impressive. Like it's oh, the group dynamics are hard. Oh, that's yeah. I'm even more impressed. It was a homebrew with a system that he made himself. Well, that's I a, uh, that's very cool. 
I, I do like how you could take the comment one of two ways. He's just like, I'm a psycho DM who makes sure that everyone stays involved as he's got every all of his players chained to the table for four years. Well, no, no, but, but you got I'm just kidding. That's that's just a joke, but it's the nature, true. The nature that's of the plot arcs, man, is is hard because it you, there tends to be a focus and sometimes the focus takes over. That's <laughs> it's a lot it's a lot of work and make Yeah, no. Good Booker job. Food. That's yeah, amazing. We, we appreciate it. But yeah, well, that's that's super cool. It, maybe that maybe is, one day cool. you can give us pointers. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll take. But it I, what I was gonna say, uh, the only way we could get our party to last that long would be if we did chain them in a basement for four years. We might have to. <laughs> hey, you know, I, I maybe maybe that makes me too nice. I have no idea. Um, but yeah, so it was easier when it was easier when we were playing in person though, because we also mm -hmm. would see each other outside of the game, and then we could yeah. guilt each other um, more effectively. No, it, it it helps when you have the contact. <laughs> it's moving all over the country and spreading out and stuff it does dampen. <laughs> it's true. It's true. No, but but it's honestly it's cool, and I and I love hearing stories about that because yeah. it you know like there was there was this one thing, and I don't even remember where I read it, but this guy had been in the same campaign for like. 40 years or something like that it was the guy where his daughter joined and then her boy her daughter played and then her boyfriend was playing and he's like you realize if you guys break up mm -hmm. he's still in the game right like the, he doesn't drop out of the game <laughs> just because you guys don't like each other anymore. he's not yeah. allowed to leave yeah, yeah so like, he, literally, that, that was an interest it's a bio it's a biopic it's uh I'll, I'll look it up uh but it's a it's a little it's a, like a documentary on this guy uh yeah. he also doesn't let the other players touch their miniatures oh that was a weird <laughs> thing. like but he but he creates these vast battle mat areas and stuff like that yeah. he basically says where do you want to move your character to i think um oh well that's that's a good idea for breaking up campaigns so that you get a little bit of variety in there and that would definitely help jeff out you know in terms of like oh i i don't think i want to play this character i think i think i've tried to do that a little bit but i haven't done it in the same game world so what ends up happening is is that i park a campaign after getting to a natural break in it and then because there are so many other ideas just rumbling around in my head yeah. or again, I have play, a, that I, then my break accidentally becomes permanent. Um, that's my fault. I have a lot of different stories go like running through my head all the time. And I, I don't know, maybe it's attention deficit disorder or something, but I am very much a, Ooh, this would be fun to run in this system. Ooh, this would be fun to run in this system. <laughs> and like, it makes sticking to one thing really, 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 really yeah. hard. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's no, i like it i like it well we appreciate the the comments and everything tonight that's yeah awesome. this is the most this is the most viewers we've ever had thank you everybody at least on stream you know people will actually view our content afterwards but yeah, i mean cool. i mean live viewing us being yeah, yeah it's awesome ourselves. And, and we appreciate the interaction yeah. yeah thank you guys so um i think but i think that's enough for me because this is actually getting late where you guys are at and i want to keep you guys forever but uh no, it's yeah. been fun interacting. Uh, it's been fun interacting, and uh, yeah, it was fun making. We, we, we like to, we like talking about this stuff, and so yeah. getting to talk with new people about this stuff is just as exciting as talking about it amongst ourselves. So, so if you don't happen to catch our streams on Mondays, because uh, we do we do hang out on Mondays eight thirty typically, and we usually do like we actually play games um, anywhere between poorly and and. Well, we'll see. Anywhere uh, between poorly, anywhere between good and and not and bad. <laughs> yeah, it's up to you. Um, but you can always jump in the comments. You know, I think Jeff has some contact information for us if you want to find us another way. Yeah, we we are on social media. We are at Rollwise on Facebook, Threads, Twitter, and YouTube. Or we do have an email address. It is RollWiseGuys at gmail .com. And as always, thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate uh, anyone who uh, listens to this after the fact. And we really appreciate everyone who joined us tonight. So thank you. Uh, force your friends or other people to join as well. So we have more viewers in the future and we can talk with people. Yeah. Um, but as always, roll well, roll wise, and be safe out there, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>